We're going to talk about uh, nutrition for children and teens. One of the biggest issues facing children of this current generation is the risk of being overweight and obese. We see this um, all the time. Go out to the supermarket, go to a school, and you'll see that kids are too large. Now, there are a lot of factors contributing to this phenomena, so we kind of have to unpack that a little bit. And you'll hear politicians talk about it, you'll hear nutritionists, doctors, parents, everybody has an opinion. So I'm going to present some of the things that I think are contributing to this problem. One of the ones I want to talk about right off is screen time and television. Now, television is kind of a triple whammy, if you will. Um, it requires no energy expenditure. We can sit there and be incredibly passive when we're watching TV. And it also replaces active time. So you think about children who might go out and play in the yard and run around and all that kind of stuff. Now they're inside more than they ever were before. It's not just television, but it's also computers. So they're online chatting with their friends and things like that. So they are two of the impacts. Um, then we also see a couple of other things. Um, ads. Think about the number of advertisements and commercials. They're not for things like broccoli. They're for you know, sugar-sweetened beverages and cereals and things like this. So children are getting this impression um, about the foods that maybe are appropriate for their age. Also, fast food is heavily advertised. So watch um, some kind of children's program, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Then we also have a lot of habits around food and TV. And I like to think about this as the habituation of food and TV. So when children are young, sometimes we'll give them a snack in front of the television. And so then later, they go in to watch TV, and they kind of are programmed to have a snack. So we see it feeding on both ends of this. Uh, I often tell parents, please don't fall into that habit of giving the child a snack in front of television. Um, but you know, you could also harness it to your benefit, depending on what you're serving. If it was carrot sticks or something like that, that's a fine snack to have in front of the TV. But what we want to get away from is that mindless eating. For instance, we would never you know, give Junior a whole bag of potato chips and then send um, them in to watch TV. That's going to be a huge problem. We also know that there's a relationship between television viewing and long-term consequences. Because of that increased body weight, we see a lot of risks related to chronic disease, especially things like obesity um, and cardiovascular disease. And remember that heart disease is the number one killer of adults, but the seeds of that are sown very, very early in life. And there's some research pointing to this being as early as, you know, in the five, six, seven, eight-year-old range, where depending on their diet, they start to show markers of cardiovascular disease risk. Um, also, children um, have higher blood pressure than ever, insulin resistance, which is going to you know, potentially develop into a diabetic situation. And that's really kind of these warning signs that are going to tip us off that we need to make a change. And they also you know, have other risks, um, asthma, um, exercise-induced asthma especially, um, because they aren't used to being active. And carrying around that extra weight and trying to be active is very, very difficult for anyone. So you know, when children are trying to be active, um, they can face some barriers just based on their body size. Children who are overweight also face uh, social stigmatization. That's a hard word to say, but the idea here is that they might be more likely to be targets of bullying or social um, ostracization, where they don't feel like they fit in with their peers. And especially at the teenage years, they're hard enough. Um, kids don't need another layer added to this. Even though so many of their peers are going to be overweight, um, you know, it, it's really an uncomfortable place emotionally for children. Children are also facing developmental challenges based on their body weight. So physical development can be altered to some extent. If you think about um, children who are carrying excess body weight, they move very differently in the world. And they move, um, especially like running, their, their feet tend to flip out a little bit more. So you actually see some structural changes in things like knees, um, also orthopedic issues, um, and then psychological development. Um, and part of that can be not getting the right nutrients. Um, when you think about obesity, I really invite you to think about this as a form of malnutrition, and that children are getting too much of some things and not enough of others. And this extends to adults as well. Um, there are, um, you know, problems throughout the world facing children around excess body weight. Um, and there's really not a whole lot that medical science can offer in terms of a cure. We know that um, there are opportunities for surgical interventions, but that's really a last resort. What we want to do is have some changes in the family, if we can. 
So when we talk about these changes in the treatment of obesity, um, there are kind of integrated approaches that we could take. And we want to look at diet. We don't necessarily want to put children who are still growing and developing on a weight loss diet. Instead, it's altering the composition of the diet to include whole foods, healthier foods, just better choices. Also increasing physical activity. And again, this is a slow and low approach. Um, I wouldn't send a child out to suddenly run five miles if they haven't been active. So taking those baby steps to increase physical activity. Psychological support is really important, uh, especially if the child is feeling kind of uncertain about who they are and their body and how they're developing. Behavioral changes. This is around TV, screen time, uh, even family dynamics. Things like family dinner become really, really important. We want families to really make these changes towards better health as a unit, not singling out one child who maybe is overweight. So I see this in families sometimes where one child will be an appropriate body weight and one might be overweight. And the parents interact very differently with that overweight child. Um, and it kind of furthers their stigmatization and they don't feel good about who they are. Uh, and they, you know, there can be some issues created within those family dynamics. So when we talk about parents and their role in obesity or overweight and how they can support their child, we have to look at issues of self-concept. And parents are very, very important in, in kind of helping that child form who they are. The amount of kind of emphasis put on weight concerns it can also be problematic. Um, if the child is, is kind of continually told, oh, you're overweight, you don't need that, you need to be more active, that's not very helpful. I mean, that child very often knows that. Um, so we have to be a little bit careful of that. Instead, supporting the child, going out and playing with them rather than sending them out. Also, diet practices. It's, it's not a good idea, like I said, to, to have a low calorie or calorie restricted diet for a teenager or any young child. We don't want to further these dieting practices that are going to follow the child throughout life. So, you know, and here I'm speaking especially to moms, is little comments like, oh, do I look fat in this? Or my thighs are too big, or I can't wear a bikini, or these kinds of things. Young girls really internalize that. And the same is true for dieting practices. So if mom is continually on a diet, the child is more likely to be on a diet. And there's a study that came out a few years ago, and I think the number was around 60% of fifth and sixth grade girls said they were on a diet trying to lose weight. And we know that, you know, again, those dieting practices are not healthy. It's about physical activity, it's about behavioral changes, family dynamics. So the best way for families to kind of um, solve these issues is together. So instilling those healthy habits that are going to last a lifetime is really our goal, not short-term weight loss. Again, you know, as parents, we have to take a very long-range approach to this um, and consider that child up through their adulthood years and even their aging years. And we know that if a child is overweight or obese in childhood, they face about an 80% risk of being an overweight or obese adult. So there's plenty of reason for us to really attack this problem. One of the things that we can do is to actually hold a child's weight steady and wait for them to grow taller. And now this might sound a little bit silly, but the idea here is that they're going to stretch out as they get taller so that they kind of grow into their body weight. And again, weight loss is not recommended. What we can actually see when people have a calorie restricted diet is that it interferes with their normal growth patterns. And that's again, you know, there's critical periods in development of young children. And if we interfere with energy that's delivered to that child during that time, we could see that they face things like um, being shorter for stature so that they're actually stunted a little bit. Very often the stunting occurs when there's inadequate protein and calories, and especially in developing worlds. But we want children to grow as they naturally should at their own pace. So keeping that energy appropriate levels, but just making sure that the diet is full of all kinds of good foods. Portion size is also critically important. And I think that one of my mantras that I kind of talk about a lot is that there's no food that's completely evil or off limits. It's how much you use in your diet. So we want to look at portion sizes, and they've been skewed dramatically over the years. Um, you can even take um, like an apple. That's a healthy food, but most apples are two servings, not one, right? So you know, we can think about healthy foods and that sometimes those servings are more than we realize we're eating, but also more likely unhealthy foods. Things like pasta um, you know, or other kinds of grains, meat, we're often eating larger servings of that than we need. So we don't want to um, you know, have larger portions. Um, we want to boost physical activity, and we don't want that child to feel singled out. 
Some other things that we can do um, are not using food as a reward or a punishment. And that's, um, you know, I think about so many cases where this happens, maybe on a sports team. You know, you play Little League and you go out for ice cream sundaes after you win the game. You know, that's really not a very good practice because that translates then to the child feeling that when they've gotten an A on a report card or something else that they need to reward with food. There are plenty of other ways to reward a child besides, you know, including food. You also want to play vigorously outdoor every single day. Um, for children, about an hour a day of active playtime. They really need that for physical development, for stress reduction, all of these kinds of things. You can involve your child in shopping for groceries. Now, I know that some parents will say it's a nightmare to take their toddlers or things like that. I'm really talking about slightly older children or children that can kind of manage that situation. Um, very often when my kids were little, I would say, well, we're going to have a green vegetable. Do you want it to be broccoli or spinach? They love having a choice. And then we would bring it home and we would prepare it together. And that really gets that kid involved and excited about the food they're going to eat. This is very true with things like gardening. So school gardens or community gardens, kids grow that food and they're more likely to eat it. Learning appropriate portion sizes. Um, so you know, let the child, as soon as they're able to, make their own lunch for school. My husband actually had this experiment with our kids when they were little with our three-year-old. And she would make her own lunch for preschool. And she would put in the exact number of carrots she wanted, exactly how many crackers, how much cheese, or whatever it was. And it was interesting because I remember the preschool teacher saying to my husband um, and to me, you're not sending enough food because your child eats it all. And it was kind of a head scratcher for me. So I watched, I went and I observed lunch. And the other children were throwing away a tremendous amount of food or feeling that they had to finish it. Whereas my daughter ate exactly how much she wanted and never said she didn't have enough. So if you can get that child to kind of clue into their own hunger and choose foods that are appropriate, that's perfect. Because it can set them up to do that later in life. You want to very carefully limit high sugar and high fat foods. This doesn't mean you can't have them. It just means you want to be a little bit of a gatekeeper with them. There's no reason that you have to have dessert every night. There's no reason that we have to make these foods available. You're not a bad parent. You're not torturing your child if they aren't available in your home. And remember that if you don't have them in the home, the child is going to have less access to them. So if you don't want your child eating ho-hos and ding-dongs and Doritos, then don't bring them home. And you know, if you do have them at home, you know, figure out what a portion size is and talk to your child about that. And this also includes um, different kinds of soft drinks, right? We want to make sure that if we're choosing those foods, that it's the right amount. And we choose them kind of sparingly. Some other strategies for helping your child to make good decisions um, include having a healthy breakfast. When we look at people who don't eat breakfast, they actually tend to weigh more than people who have a nutritious breakfast. This might be a little bit surprising because if you're thinking about calories, it might be, you know, kind of an equation that doesn't make sense. In studies looking at girls who eat breakfast, they actually tend to weigh less. Because if you've gone to bed and then you don't eat until maybe lunch the next day, your body's really, really hungry. And it changes the foods that you choose. You're more likely to choose high energy, high fat, high sugar foods, because you need that quick energy. So make sure that they have a good breakfast. Also, snacks are important. Um, about 25% of a teenager's diet is snacks. So that doesn't mean that they have to be snack foods, like Doritos or chips or things like that. I'm a huge advocate in second lunch. I think that's so important for teenagers. So when they come home from school, rather than having you know, chocolate chip cookies and a glass of milk, that they actually have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich or a tuna fish sandwich or something like this, um, that second lunch idea where they're getting you know, good nutrition, um, but they're also satisfying their need for a snack. Um, you can also make sure that you're providing fruit juices within recommendations. There are a couple of things you can do here. The recommendation is one serving of juice a day, but you could also water it down. Um, so, you know, you don't, I mean, you don't even have to serve juice at all. I think it's a junk food. Um, serve a piece of fruit instead. Now, a lot of people, you know, feel like they want to start their breakfast with some orange juice. Well, you could water it down if you wanted to. And with little kids in a, like a sippy cup, you definitely want to water it down. It's just full of sugar. Um, and you're missing all the good parts of the fruit. The other thing is that those beverages, especially sugar-sweetened beverages like sodas and sweet tea and things like this, don't increase satiety. So you don't feel full after you've eaten them. And we're drinking a lot more energy than we ever have before. And that contributes to obesity. The only food that has been conclusively linked to obesity is sugar-sweetened beverages.
So keep that in mind. It's not necessarily fast food or cheese or chips or these other things. It's juice that we actually see a very, very strong correlation with. Now I mentioned family meals before. It's really important to actually sit down and eat dinner with your family, your children, your, your partner, um, having you all come together at the table. And now this isn't just about nutrition, it's about communication. Um, you know, children that eat with their family um, tend to do drugs less, or not at all, hopefully. Um, their use of alcohol and tobacco is reduced. Um, teenage pregnancy is also reduced. So it's an opportunity for the family to come together and talk. They also eat more slowly. So if you think about Europeans, this is the one thing Americans say, oh, I love the European tradition of actually sitting down and having two hours for a meal or something like this. You don't have to do that. You know, just, just find that time to sit down and check in with the kids or check in with your partner, um, and you actually strengthen those relationships. Now, there are so many other things that we can talk about in addition. And one of the things that um, I think sometimes parents uh, underestimate is their potential to be a role model. And it can go both ways. If you're a positive role model, you know, you're really going to influence those food decisions your child makes up until about the age of 10 or 12 especially because you're the gatekeeper. You decide what comes into the home. After the age of 10 or 12, really it's media, it's friends, it's the school environment that's going to kind of take hold and influence your child to some extent. But if you've created this really strong foundation, they're going to have these skills to fall back on at some point. Maybe not, you know, in their teenage years. Maybe it won't happen until they're in their 20s or 30s and they're like, oh, you know, mom and dad were right. This is how I should be eating. If you're a poor nutritional role model, um, your children are going to pick up on that too. So, you know, when I talk to families uh, about teenage nutrition or how to feed their children, um, I really ask them, you know, what are you doing? What are your practices around food? I don't want to make parents feel bad or feel guilty or anything like that. That isn't what this is about. It's actually, you know, increasing the health of the entire family. And this is such a wonderful opportunity, right? Because you want that child to be healthy for life. Slow down, pause. Um, I don't know about you, but you know, when I'm in a hurry, I'm, I'm chewing and I've got my fork loaded with the next bite. Why not actually put the fork down between bites? Take time. It takes about 20 minutes for your stomach to send that message to your brain that you're full. So you want to stop eating at some point. Um, and if we eat very quickly, um, we don't get that signal. One thing that we, um, I see this all the time with young children, especially in a school setting, they maybe get 20, 25 minutes for lunch if they're lucky, sometimes 10 or 15. They have to eat very, very quickly. They're, they're kind of taught to eat quickly. Um, and we don't want to do that. We want to actually help them slow down a little bit. Uh, this is a failing of our educational system. But we can, at home, control that a little bit. So, you know, take some steps to do that. You also want to stop eating when you're full. This is for parents, this is for kids. So no clean plate club. You know, if the child says they're full, they're full. Um, and you want to honor that. It doesn't mean that they get to then come back and have a lot of snacks. You really need to explain how the system's going to work. Um, I'm going to save your plate for later or whatever. You know, you're going to have to kind of negotiate that for yourself. But when a child says they're full, you don't want to have to continue, you know, to, to prod them to eat. That's not a great idea. I mentioned that breakfast was really important to children. And there are some reasons kind of aside from nutrition. Um, we've talked about how they're more likely to be overweight. But also, it's harder for children to concentrate when they're hungry right? Because they're thinking about food or their brain just is not in that space to learn. So we know that they're more likely to uh, perform poorly, especially on standardized tests and things like that. Um, and in a school in Boston, Project Bread did a uh, research um, project with Harvard. And one of the things that they found is that if they fed children in one particular school, everybody got breakfast. They had an enormous reduction, about 75% reduction in issues of discipline um, in the classroom. They also had children showing up on time for school. And they had less sick days for these kids. So there's plenty of reasons to get them up, get them fed. Um, and you know, when, a chil when children are well fed, they're ready to learn. This has often been a kind of a head scratcher to me, um, why schools don't take a more active role in this. Um, if they want kids to do well on MCAS or other kinds of standardized tests, you actually have to feed them when they're learning, not just suggest that they have a good breakfast on test days, which is something that's pretty common in, in school nutrition practice. 
I want to talk a little bit more about that school environment around nutrition. And um, really, I think that um, school nutrition has been vilified, and you know, the, an opinion warning here. Um, I think it's very, very challenging on um, what schools are facing in many, many ways. They don't have sufficient budgets um, in, in many, many cases to provide adequate nutrition for lunch or breakfast or snack or things like that. Schools, you know, and, and students are facing multiple areas for improvement. There isn't enough time allotted to eating and that social environment and being able to talk to their friends. Um, there's long lines in the lunchroom. Um, they don't like some of the foods being served, so they're more likely to grab, like if there's cookies or chips or something like that, they're not going to eat you know, the macaroni and cheese or pizza or something else that might be a slightly better choice if there's an alternative that's highly palatable. There's also competitive foods. And one thing in the past probably five or 10 years is they've removed a lot of those vending machines from schools, which is a great move. But we also need to make sure that that food that we're serving is actually something kids want to eat. And it doesn't need to all be highly processed and, and sweetened. So we need to get away from tater tots and serve more salad and things like this. Um, so here are all the foods that we really need to have caution around. And we need to look at the role of school snack bars and school stores and vending machines. Um, one of the reasons that some of these schools will actually um, allow vending machines is that they make money off it. Um, so you have to kind of look at some of the competing interests here because I think it's hard to provide good nutritious food if you're also trying to make money off students. Some things that we could do to promote better nutrition at school is that we could look at those different foods that we're serving. Um, we could look at alternative sources of funding. We also want to make sure that our foods that we're serving meet the dietary guidelines. And not always is that true. Um, and if we price things competitively, um, you know, kids will choose apples over treats. Um, we see that time and again in studies. And improving the training of food service staff. Most of the people working in for food service don't necessarily have a background there. Uh, and again, this comes down to funding, that these people are not adequately trained or that their income is not appropriate for the job we're asking them to do. Let's look at the teen years and some of the challenges that teenagers face. And some of these are probably familiar to you if you think back you know, in your lifetime. Um, irregular eating habits are very, very common. Um, you know, kids are hungry at different times of the day. They're growing, you know, so one day they may be very hungry, the next day not so much. They also have extraordinary energy demands. Uh, I think about a teenage boy that's maybe 16 or 17. He's probably just going to eat tremendous amounts. It would not be unusual for him to need 3,000 up to 4,000 calories, especially if he's playing a sport and he's growing. They tend to use a lot of snacks. So we want to make sure that snacks available in the home include fresh fruits, vegetables, low-fat dairy choices, like string cheese, yogurts. Those are all great choices. Um, they eat more fast food than perhaps is healthy uh, because it's quick. It's highly palatable. Um, it's also got a certain kind of social panache to it in some situations. Um, and it's readily available in a lot of communities. They have a multiple demands on their time. And this can really skew opportunities for family meals. So jobs, different kinds of social activities, and home responsibilities, and even homework. Kids today have more homework than ever before. And that really interferes with good nutrition in a lot of ways. Um, maybe they aren't making good choices because of maturity levels. Also, they don't understand the link between diet and health always. So this is an opportunity to talk to them about that, that maybe they don't feel as good or as energetic after they eat a high fat meal from McDonald's. Instant gratification. Now, this affects you know, adults as well as children. Um, we want to actually show them you know, that there's ways that they can, they can eat healthy um, with a short amount of time, and it doesn't have to be fast foods. If we look at meal patterns with uh, adolescents, there are certain choices that they're making. So during adolescence, they're often missing out on some of the key nutrients they need. We can think about things like calcium, zinc, iron, especially for young girls. They're more likely to skip breakfast. And those nutrients aren't made up later in the day, even if they're getting the same amount of calories. Now, that might not make intuitive sense to you, but if you think about the typical breakfast in the US, it's a fortified food. So breakfast cereal or fortified bread or something like that. Unless they're eating that fortified food later, they're going to miss out on some of those key micronutrients. Then also, the foods they're choosing are different. Today, we're consuming less milk, more juice, more water, more sodas, um, and fewer vegetables and fruits. So again, we want to promote those. 
And in the U.S., we don't so much have a vegetable problem as a fruit problem. Teenagers are pretty good at getting fruit, um, but not so much with um, the vegetables. Then also soft drinks. Um, even calorie-free soft drinks are not a good idea. Um, they can have pretty significant implications for dental health, um, even if it's a diet soda. So instead, um, choosing water, even seltzer, can be a pretty good choice for kids if they want something kind of fizzy. I've used this word gatekeeper a couple times when I'm talking about parents. Um, and I don't really, I, I don't want to underestimate the potential of parents and the role that they play. So I've talked about how they're good role models or they can be less good role models and the, the impact there. But as children age, um, that role of gatekeeper changes a little bit. Um, you can, as a parent of a teenager, control their environment in only very certain ways. They go off to school, they go off to a job, maybe they're highly mobile because they have a car. You can't control the food environment as much as you did when they were toddlers or when they were young children. So you have to think about that home nutrition environment and what you're going to provide. We know that teenagers, uh, left to their own devices, rarely seek out vegetables outside of the home. So make sure that the vegetables are served in the home. You also want to make sure that there's easy to grab and go foods. So I think I've used this example before. If I have a whole cantaloupe sitting on the counter, it's going to rot before one of my daughters cuts into it. Instead, I'm going to have it all prepped and ready to go in front of the refrigerator. I'm going to put the foods that are maybe less um, nutritious towards the back because, again, when you look at a teenager, they don't move things in the refrigerator. They stand there with the door open. And whatever they see first, they're more likely to choose. So capitalize on that a little bit if you can. Okay? And also, if you have fruit stored on the counter, um, like a bowl of apples or bananas, um, it's in view. Put the cookies up in the cupboard. You don't necessarily need to have those in view. Okay? So, you know, we can, we can look at also the opportunity for teenagers to be their own gatekeepers. And so this is something I'll talk to my daughters about, um, especially when they're playing sports and being really active. What are you going to do to make sure that you have good nutritious choices for today? And then I help them make those choices a little bit. You know, kids really want to do the right thing for their body. We just have to be that role model for them. I told you already that 25% of energy for a teenager comes from snack foods. We want to make sure that those snack foods aren't too high in saturated fat or sodium. We also want to make sure that they have things like fiber in them. So even within the snack food pantheon, you go down the aisle at the supermarket and there's all these different chips you could choose, all these different things. Um, go for whole grain crackers or whole grain chips when you can, things that are baked instead of fried, things that are lower sodium. Read the food labels, make those good choices. Um, and you know, provide some opportunity for them to get their calcium. It could be almonds. It doesn't have to be milk. It could be soy milk. Just make sure that it's available to them. We also see that teens have a lot of trouble getting enough iron and vitamin A. And I've mentioned iron as being a significant problem for teenage girls especially. So, you know, really look for those sources in their, in their no kind of normally accepted foods. Uh, maybe they have to have a fortified cereal in the morning. Make sure that it has enough iron for them. There are lots of ways that that gatekeeper can exercise some nutritional control, but, but it's also about keeping lines of communication open. We want to make sure that we can talk to our teenagers about nutrition. So that sometimes that's having um, different kinds of information and resources available. It's talking with a pediatrician sometimes, making sure that our child is growing how they should be, uh, and, and you know, really looking at the foods that are being served at home. Ultimately, though, these choices are up to the teenager. Um, and parents can, you know, just, um, you know, really be frustrated uh, very often with teenagers. So understand that they need to make choices. And this is part of growing up. So if we look at developmental patterns of teenagers, exercising nutritional independence is really important for them. Um, no child and no adult, you know, makes perfect choices all the time. So allow them some room to experiment and just to help them connect what they're choosing and how they feel and then long-term health.